I'm healed. I'm favored. I'm going to live an abundant life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. As we do here at Compassion in reverence of the Word of God, uh, will you stand with me for the reading of His Word? Amen, amen, amen. Those of you, again, watching us online right now, uh, go ahead and share this video and let us know uh, what it is we can believe in prayer for you over. Uh, and then if you're ever in the area, we'd like to invite you to come out to Compassion Church. It's great online, but it's better in person. So uh, 2862 Thousand Oaks, we will wait for you here and, and greet you with open arms. Amen. All right, well, let's declare it together today. You ready? This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. It is my sword against the enemy. I believe who it says I am, what it says is mine, and everything it says I can accomplish. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You believe that today? Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Today we're going to go to one of the most famous Bible accounts of all time. It is the most famous battle of all time found in the Word of God. Uh, This battle took place in the Valley of Elah, five miles inside of Israel from the Philistine border. You have an army standing against an army. And I want you to see in the theater of your mind this morning uh, that this, the, the, the shine of the armor stretches for miles. And there you have two armies. The Philistine army against the army of Israel. Two opposing sides, but both of them had been standing, looking at each other across the valley for 40 days. 40 days, no one has drawn a sword. A horse has not moved. Why? Because of one man. One giant has been able to hold Israel's fiercest warriors at bay. One man. One man. Now we know the rest of the story. We know how a shepherd boy shows up and he takes his five stones, only needs one of them, (laughs) takes his slingshot and slays that giant. We know that part of the story. We know the story of David and Goliath, but do you know the opposition he was against? And so this part three, time to turn it around, this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the taunting that the enemy does. We're going to to look at how the world criticizes and speaks and shuts down the church of Jesus Christ so often. It's time to turn it around. This morning, we are going to look at whatever giant is facing you, and you are going to say, not by sword, not by javelin, but by the name of God Almighty, I come against you. This is what we're going to do this morning as we look at this story, David and Goliath. You know, when David rode up, not one person was excited to see him. Not one person said, oh, there's little Davy. He's going to save the day. He's going to cut the head off the giant. They didn't say that because nobody saw anything special in this young lad. Nobody. His brothers didn't see it. King Saul didn't see it. Never mind, he had already been anointed to be the next king of Israel. But no one saw anything special in him but God. But God. God did. He didn't need anybody's approval. And it didn't matter what people said. He was there on a mission. So we're going to look at that today. But let's see what happens when little David... Rides up. 1 Samuel 17. We're going to go 28. Then we're going to go 33. Then we're going to go 43 through 45. Ready? Read along with me as I read. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked him, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are. And how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. You're a spectator. Saul replied. This is how King Saul replied to him coming. You are not able to go out and get against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. And he has been a warrior from his youth. What did Goliath say to David when he saw him? 
Goliath said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now let's look at David's response to all of these fools. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Hallelujah. Woo! Father God, I just pray this morning that you will help me preach this message, Father. That, Lord God, it will be adequate in teaching. That, Lord God, you will anoint me by the power of the Holy Ghost. That it will be all of you and none of me in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Everybody say, time to turn it around. Oh, time to turn it around. Turn your love around. What? Sorry. Time to turn it around. Time to turn it around, part three. The giant before me. A giant before me. I want you to imagine in the theater of your mind as David is riding down to the valley of Elah from his farmhouse and everybody is just standing around. They're just standing around. They've been standing around for 40 days. And I can see David get off of his little horse and say, Hey, what's up, guys? What are y'all doing? I mean, you've been standing here for 40 days. Is anyone going to fight? What you gonna... Have you ever seen like a schoolhouse fight? And they're like, come on. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You, come on, come on. Yeah, you, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I'm going to get you, come on. This is what they're doing for 40 days. 40 days. Why was the army of Israel so paralyzed? Because of fear. One man already had them whooped without even having to draw a sword. One man. One man, watch this. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and they lost all hope. It says in the Bible, when they saw the giant, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. One giant, one man against all of Israel's finest warriors. And he's already got them whooped. He didn't have to do one thing. And listen to what he says to them. He says, put your best. Come on, give me your best. If one person is able to come out and face me, we will all become your slaves. But if I overtake him, you all will be our slaves. And they were terrified. The reality is they were already his slave. You know why? Because of fear. Because that's what fear does. The devil uses it to enslave us, to tie us, to bind us, to paralyze us, to terrorize us. This is what he does. He gets in our minds and he clouds it all up. Have you ever seen people that live sick? Even before they get a diagnosis? Have you ever seen somebody who's already rejected before the attempt? I used to know a guy. He, he would always say, well, one day I'm going to ask her out. Well, one day I'm going to ask. And then the next day, one day I'm going to ask her out. One day I'm going to, well, what, she, what if she rejects me? What if, Dude, you're already rejected before the attempt. What are you doing? Defeated before the fight. Knocked out before the first punch. Listen to me this morning. We got a pandemic in this country. And it's, it's listen, it's a pandemic and it's not a virus. We got a, we got a terrorism problem in this country and it's not a backpack and bombs. I'll tell you what it is. It's F-E-A-R, fear. Have you seen so many people ever in your life walking around terrified? Terrified and terrorized by the enemy, by the devil. Let me tell you something, fear is a spirit. It's a spirit that, a spirit that comes directly from the pit of hell. And even Christians who have been Christians for decades are walking around in fear. Everywhere you go, people are gripped with fear. It used to be when somebody would get in trouble, when somebody needed help, that the first, first person that came across would jump in and help them. Have you, have you, and now people would they take out their phone. Well, I'm going to get a lot of views on this one. <laughs> hit him again. Hit him again. Hit him again. I saw a video. I saw a video. I saw a video of a poor woman. 
in a New York subway car, all by herself, and this other person came in and grabbed her by the hair, yanked her down, and forced her to put her head on his shoulder just like this. And she was doing help. Please, somebody help me right now. Please, somebody help me. It was a subway car full of guys. And not one person lifted a finger to help her. Instead, half a dozen people in that subway were just recording it. One person. It's a spirit of fear. It's a spirit of fear. Proverbs 29 says that the fear of men lay a snare, a a, a trap. But whoever trusts in the Lord, everybody say trust in the Lord, is safe. It's safe. (laughs) It's safe. Woo! One giant terrorizing an entire army. One crazed lunatic terrorizing an entire subway car. One demoniac, demoniac in Uvalde terrorizing an entire police force. Fear. Paralyzed. With fear. You can't think straight. You don't know what to do next. No training can help you. Because fear has gripped you. These were trained mighty warriors. And one Bubba has come out onto their valley. Made a couple of threats. And everybody is shaking in their boots. One. I praise God for Angelique Gomez. Angelique Gomez. Do you know who she is? Angeli Gomez is the mother of two kids who attend Rob Elementary School in Uvalde. And she was there at her kids' celebration as they got their awards that morning. She was embarrassed to be there because all she had to wear were some farm clothes. She worked as a, as a farmer 10 miles down the road. And when she went back to her job after the award ceremony and she started working the fields again, she got a call that there was a shooter in her children's elementary school. She didn't hesitate. She got in the car, and she drove, she says, 100 miles an hour back to the school. She got out of her car, walked past the barricade, when all of a sudden a U.S. marshal said, you better stop right there, or do you know what will happen to you? We will have to arrest you. And she said what my mama would have said, you go ahead and arrest me. But there's a shooter in there pointing guns at my child, and I see you all out here. Guess what? This mama is going in. She's four, she was, she's four foot nine, 95 pounds. They tackled her to the ground, they handcuffed her, and after a while, she was able to convince somebody to get those cuffs off of her. What do you think mama did when cuffs came off? Corale, she ran, hurdled that fence. She went into harm's way with bullets flying, saved both of her children from two different classrooms, and then helped save the rest of the kids in those two classrooms. God bless you, Angelique Gomez. We need more fearless warriors in this earth like you. Church of Jesus Christ, it's time to stand and grow a back bone and look the devil square in the eyes and say no more you will not go after our kids you cannot have our kids you can't you can't do this to our family anymore in jesus name amen when david arrived on the battlefield it was so obvious to him young man no training not a part of the army in the midst of thousands of Israeli soldiers, and it was so obvious to him. Because they had been plagued with fear day after day. And I want you to notice something. All the times that you have been paralyzed with fear, have you noticed the more you wait, the more scared, I'm going to say scared, you get? You have time to think on it a little bit, and it starts to grip you. Mark Contreras will tell you, he's been an officer for for many, many years, been in law enforcement. He'll tell you that training, their training, will show them to react fast, to not think. You think, you die, right? You go for it. And this is the same principle. We must move fast. You have the spirit of the living God inside of you. 
You have the spirit of the living God inside of you. And listen to what David, David, it was so obvious to David. And he got there and listen to what he says. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the Lord? Who is this guy? I mean, I can see him standing around looking, who, who, who is this guy? Come on, who is this? He didn't even call him a giant. He called him uncut, unsnipped, uncircumcised. <laughs> Philistine, not a giant. And David says, I'll take him. I'll take him. Yeah. What? What? What are you thinking? They called him every name in the book. What are you doing here? Go back to your few sheep. Go back. You're incompetent. You're not worthy to be on this battlefield with us. One brother even they, they called him wicked and conceited and said, you just want to come out here and watch us fight. I would have said, I'm going to be waiting a long time to watch you fight. You've been out here 40 days, man. He said, let me at him. Let me at him. I mean, even Goliath was offended by David. He said, you, you come at me with this stick, man? <laughs> You come at me with, with Twiggy? You come at me with this guy? I mean, a toothpick versus a tornado, a mini bike versus a 18-wheeler, a, a toy poodle versus a Rottweiler. Are you kidding me? And Shelby and I's case, our, our, our baby girl, our baby girl right now fighting every single day and surpassing everybody, just fighting a, a micro preemie born a pound and a half, and her giant was every odd stacked against her. Hallelujah. I'll never forget the second day. I'll never forget it. Man, she was fierce. She was feisty. She's tiny but mighty. Amen. Someone said, she's tiny, but she's super fierce. And nobody has told her how fragile she is. But you got to know who you are, you see. You got to know who you are. You got to know who your God is. You got to know who your God is. They told him he's nine feet nine inches tall, Davy. His sword is longer than your height. His, his armor alone weighs 200 pounds. But David was like, What giant? I don't see no giants. I see an uns uncircumcised Philistine. I don't see any giants. The reason he didn't see any giants is because there was only one giant in his life. And that was Almighty God. Watch this now. The first thing I need to tell you this morning is if you want to see whatever you're facing turn around, you've got to stop thinking like the world and start thinking like God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Stop thinking like the world. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. The Bible says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, and whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, and whom shall I be? Be afraid. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Hallelujah. God himself lives in you through his Holy Spirit. God, see, that's the thing. That's what it means to be a, a man after God's own heart. That's what it means to be a woman after God's own heart. You do not think as the world thinks. Amen. The things that scare the world don't scare you. Amen. The things that upset God upset you. The things that please God please you. Oh, my Lord, we got to pray for the church in America that has become so watered down. You don't know if they're the world or they're the church or what they stand on or what they stand for. And all they want to do is give you seven principles to make your life happy and tickle your ears. But let me tell you something right now. The church of Jesus Christ has some training to do. We've got to train up warriors because we are living in dark times. We got to train up an army, an army of the Lord who is willing to square their shoulders back, look the devil in the eyes and say, Bring it on, Bubba. I am not backing down. Hard times will come. Persecution will come. But you are the church of Jesus Christ. And your light should always overtake darkness everywhere you go. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I see no giant here. Because no matter how big this giant is, my God is bigger. 
No matter how strong this giant is, my God is stronger. No matter how tall this giant is, my God is taller. And you've got to refuse to see it as the world sees it. You, the diagnosis, you can't see it as the world sees it. The no, the closed doors in your life, you can't see it as the world sees it. The impossibility as the world calls it, you can't see it as the world sees it. You can't even see yourself as the world sees you, okay? You can't do that. You can't do that. David said, I don't see any giants here because there is only one giant in my life and his name is El Shaddai, the mighty one, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Rapha, my healer, Jehovah Nisi, my victory, Jehovah Shalom, my peace. What giant? I see no giants here. There's only one giant in, his, in my life and he is the great I am. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He, was the, he is the beginning and the end, the one who was and forever shall be what giant I see no giants here there is only one giant in my life and he is my shield he is my fortress he is my high tower he is my rock he is my hiding place he is my sword he is my provider he is my everything he is my healer he is my all and all what giants hallelujah hallelujah All they could do was talk about the giants. Have you ever met somebody that all they do is talk about the giants? They got a degree in giant. <laughs> Major in giantology and minor I, in I wet myself. All they want to do is talk about the giants. This is what happened to me. This is my giant this week. This is my giant. My giant. My giant. And David... Majored in what God can do. You major in what God can do. Get your degree in what God can do. You read his word over and over and over and over and over and over and meditate on it day and night, day and night. Wallpaper your house with it if you have to. But you meditate day and night on what God can do because the world is loud and trying to get in your head. They told him, go home. You have no business do being here, man. You come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. You come at me with your weaponry. Mm. But I don't fight against flesh and blood. Oof. I fly, fight in the spirit against principalities of darkness. And then he said, it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. Listen to these words that, that David had for the giant. Watch. The battle is the Lord's. It's not mine. The battle is the Lord's. And because the battle is the Lord's, he will give you into our hands. The battle is the Lord's. This is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? When all hell is breaking loose, it's so hard. It's so hard. When people are opposing you and people are coming against you, it's so hard. It's so hard to just let the Lord do what he's going to do. The battle is is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. It's not mine to worry about. It's not mine to keep me up at night. It's not mine to take, rob me of my peace. It's not mine. You know what Exodus 14 says? It says the Lord will fight for you. Watch. And you will only have to be silent. Anyone here have issue like I do of being silent? Ay, 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 ay. But I need to really tell them. I need to tell them. I need to tell them. You need to be silent. I need to set the record straight. They're out there saying things, all kinds of nasty things about me and my friends. I'm going to remain silent. Because there is no better defender than him. He is able to defend me better than I am able to defend myself. And the moment you try to get in the fight and start to defend yourself, our God will back off and say, okay, well, I guess you got it. You take it. He is your defender. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. David said something right before he picked, them to, picked up those stones to slay the giant. He said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. 
I have always lived my life giving him these battles. He did it before. He's going to do it again. He saved my child then. He's going to save my child now. He healed you then. He's going to do it again. He made a way for you back then when there seemed to be no way. And he's going to make a way for you today when there seems to be no way. What are you doing here, though, David? (laughs) What are you doing here, man? What was David doing there? We never get to that part of the story, do we? Why was David there? Did he go to battle? You know why David was there? The Bible tells us in Samuel 17. David went out there. Listen, one day Jesse, his dad, asked David to take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these ten cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. What did David do? So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. David was not sent out there to fight. His dad even told him, you are not one of those men. You go out there and deliver lunch. You take them some food. David had already been anointed the next king of Israel. And David could have said, do you know who you're talking to, pops? I am the next king of Israel. You know what? You want me to take pizzas out there. You want me to be a pizza delivery boy. I don't work for Domino's. I'm not Uber Eats. I'm not DoorDash. You want me to... He could have said all that, but he didn't. You want to know why? Because David was a servant. Do you want to see things turn around in your life? Find somebody to serve. 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 Serve, 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 serve. Every chance you get, serve, serve, serve. Those who live in your neighborhood, serve, serve. You see somebody at HEB that needs help, serve them, serve them. This group of people, the the care team, they went out there to Uvalde and they found people. Listen, they didn't go out there, hey, we're here, everybody. No, they, they looked for people they could serve. They looked, and the Lord showed up and did miracles. Every single mighty move in my life where God showed up wasn't because I deserved something or I was qualified for something. It was when I was serving. It's amazing what happens when you serve. It's amazing. And we have lost the art of serving. We want to be served. We want to be important. We want to be the manager. We want to be in charge. We want to lead, but my goodness, it's time to serve. Serve. And I'm not talking about the kind of people who serve in order to get recognition. I'm not talking about the people who will show up because it's serving their self-interest. I'm not talking about that kind of person. I'm not talking about the person who will only serve when they get recognition, when they get some sort of an award. And I'm not talking about a puffed-up peacock. You know those kind I'm talking, they, they just kind of show up and they want to tell you all about them. You, you talk to them for 30 minutes and 29 of those minutes is all about them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the church getting into a place where they are going to serve. I have been seeing people at this church. This is a, this is a church that, that serves. If you don't like to serve, you don't like to serve, you won't like it here. And that's not something a pastor should say, but I got to say it. You won't like, because this is a, this is atmosphere of serving here. People are here all week long serving. When nobody else is here, when nobody else sees, there are people serving all the time. You know why? Because they've gotten something. Once they start serving, they can't stop serving. And then this is contagious, and those around them want to start serving. And then God shows up, and I've seen them here till wee hours of the morning, music blasting, eating pizza, serving, vacuuming, cleaning, ironing the, ironing, what are they called? What were they ironing all that night? Exactly. Tablecloths. That was an easy one. Table. <laughs> Sounds like they, they, they serve. People give. And this is what the body of Christ looks like. Listen, the first church in the book of Acts, the Bible says that they had, listen, no lack among them. No lack among them. Why? Because they served 
one another. What a beautiful picture. You want to see things turn around in your life? Begin to serve. David served King Saul. Even though King Saul was a lunatic, he was a maniac. He, the, the, he, this guy was trying to kill him, and he was serving him. All David knew how to do was serve. He served his dad that didn't see what God saw in him. He served, he served his jerk brothers. He, served, he just wanted to keep serving. It is why the Lord said of David, this is my servant, and I am anointing him with my oil to be the next king of Israel. God is looking for servants. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He, listen, he saw this task of serving. Dad told me to go deliver him lunch. I'm going to go deliver him lunch. I'm going to do what he asked me to do. Because you cannot see your giant fall until you're willing to serve lunch to somebody. <laughs> you got to be willing to serve. Every single time the Lord will show up. I will never forget back in 2012... I was in Africa, in the country of Kenya. And I had already been there about three weeks. I was ready to come home. And uh, one of the last days I was there was a Sunday. And uh, in Africa, you know, we start kind of getting restless after about an hour or so and start thinking about lunch. In Africa, they are just getting warmed up. I think opening prayer is an hour and a half. And so I had been through two services that, well, it started early in the morning, and it was already late in the afternoon. I was ready to go home, take a shower, and jump, at the, jump in the pool at the hotel. We were just about gone. And a group of pastors came up to me in their beaut beautiful Swahili accent. They came up to me, and they said, Pastor, we are wondering if you come to our village and pray. Where's your village? Oh, three hours down the road. <laughs> three hours in Kenya. It's going to be a long trip. It ain't going to be three hours. And I was honestly, Mark, I was trying to find a way out of it, man. I got to be honest with you. I was trying to find a way out of it. And I was like, oh, come on. Can we send somebody else? You know, please. And then I saw a look on their face. They told me that they were suffering. They were under a severe drought. And for the past three years, it had not rained a drop in that section of Kenya. Severe people were starving to death. This was a farming community. Thousands, I'm talking thousands and thousands of people who were starving. And they said, please, will you come and bring us food and water? Man, I was like, all right, let's do it. So we called some different charities, and we, we were able to get as much food as we could in a pickup truck and as much water as we could, and we went down. The, it won three hours, Rita. It was not three. It was five hours down that road, a bumpy road, very, very bumpy, bumpy road. We made it there. We made it there. And I was there. We were dispersing all of the food, and it was glorious. And we were there several hours. It was getting dark. Time to go home, right? And then the, the one that, you know, they have like a village uh, chief out there. And they said, they said, prophet, 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 I am no prophet, no prophet, you prophet. The Lord sent a prophet. And they asked if I would pray to break the drought. What? <laughs> and something came over me at that moment that was not me. And this was the really a huge giant. I mean, what am I going to, what? It hasn't rained for three years. And there's not a cloud in the sky. Not a cloud. It was so hot. And so I picked up, I picked up the, some, some dirt from the ground. And it was so dry, so powdery. And I saw their faces and some compassion, a lot of compassion came over me. And you know what I began to do? I began to rebuke the curse of that drought over the land. It's the strangest thing. It just came over me. I was there to serve them. But there was this giant here. And I, they called on me to do something. And, and I did it. 
And, and we have someone from Kenya who sent us a message this morning. He'll tell you the rest of the story. Good morning, Pastor Adrian. This is John. I am recording this message from Nairobi, Kenya, to testify the goodness of God and what he did when we were here in 2012, when you were with Oral Roberts Evangelistic Ministries. And uh, we came here when there was a severe drought affected the whole country. We drove to the countryside almost like five, hour, five hours away from Nairobi, where, the, uh, where it had been hard hit. We were distributing food donated by Feed My Starving Children in the U.S., but something major happened. God broke the drought. When we prayed over the land, I remember you grabbing the soil and cursing the drought. And seven hours later, we got a call from the member of parliament saying that it started raining heavily. And the rain continued till the next morning. Broke the, the Lord broke the drought all over Kenya, not just that region. And Kenya has since been blessed. I am speaking a blessing over the United States. And I thank you also for the call of God for coming here to do what God had called. And anytime you ever wanted to come back, Kenya will receive you graciously. Amen. Amen. As I close this morning, um, when you put yourself aside and you rely 100% of the power of the living God, just watch what will happen. But you must go willing to serve somebody. You must no longer think like the world, but you got to start thinking how God sees things. And you got to say, Lord, this is not my battle. This is your battle. No matter what giant you are facing. Do you, you, I, I, I want you to imagine how I must have felt when in 3 in the morning I got a call in my hotel room. Prophet, 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 it's raining. It won't stop raining. It's raining. It's raining. It's raining. Seven hours later. Seven hours later. I woke up the next morning on the front page. It was rain, rain, rain. And has nothing to do with me. Any single one of you could have done it if you start to activate and realize the power that is inside of you. The living God who is inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I ask you this morning, what giant is before you? Two months ago, I know what giant came before us. A giant of impossibility. And when it's your own child, your knees buckle. You begin to question everything. And this is what the devil was trying to get me to do is silence me and silence this ministry. This is a ministry of truth. This is a ministry of his word. And I'm not backing down. What giant is before you? It's too big for you, isn't it? It's way too big for you. But are you willing to give that battle over to the Lord? Are you willing to say, not by my strength, but by His Spirit? Are you willing to say, I'm no longer going to think according to how the world thinks. I'm going to turn off the news every now and then. I'm going to stop being bombarded by all the voices, all the naysayers, all the, all the people who tell me it's impossible. It's hard enough. I don't need other voices to tell me anything else. You focus in on how God thinks. Cling to His Word in every single area of your life and then find somebody to serve. Be the body of Christ. This is why you were put on this earth. You're trying to look for your calling? Are you trying to look for your purpose? Do you question, well, why was I put on this earth? I'm telling you what. Find a place to serve, and God will show you exactly where you need to go and what road you need to take. Will you stand with me today? There are giants in this room of cancer. There are giants in this room of heart disease and diabetes. There are giants in this room of Marriages that are failing, of kids that are lost, 
There are giants in this room of addiction, of strongholds, of secret sins. There are giants in this room. There are giants in this room of loneliness, of depression, of anxiety. There are giants in this room. Only you know what that giant is. But today, we're going to look at that giant in the eyes. We're going to pick up our faith stones. And we're going to say, it's time to let it fly. Are you ready to let it fly? Amen, 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 amen. I don't want you to hesitate. Don't make one hesitation. If there's a giant before you that is so much bigger than you could ever, ever, ever begin to imagine, I want you to come forward now. Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Just bow down before him, for he is one. Sing Alleluia, Christ is risen, yes he has, oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And those of you who are still out there, I, I just want you to be in a spirit of prayer, please. Please, we have people here at this altar that need a miracle. But I praise God we serve a God of miracles. It's time to speak to some giants. And you're going to help me. You're going to start speaking, vocalizing with your mouth against that giant right now. Go ahead. You can use your prayer language. You can speak it out in English, Spanish. You can speak it out any way you want. But it's time. It's time. It's time to speak it out in the mighty name of Jesus of Nazareth. I thank you, Lord God, for the power of your word. I thank you, Lord God, you are the same God who made the rain fall in Kenya. The same God who can break every stronghold in this place in Jesus' mighty name. The same God who's a healer in Jesus' name. I speak to every infirmity in this place. Cancer, you have no right in Jesus' mighty name. Heart disease, you have no right in Jesus' mighty name. Diabetes, you have no right in Jesus' mighty name. High blood pressure, you have no right in Jesus' mighty name. Lupus, lupus, you have no right in Jesus' mighty name. Dementia, Alzheimer's, you foul demonic thing. You go back to hell where you belong. You have no right in this place. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I speak peace to your home today. A wave of peace to your home in Jesus' name. To your children and your children's children. I speak peace. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You're, uh, listen, you are growing a spiritual backbone right now. You're going to walk out of here with confidence like you've never had before. Not because of anything you can do, but of what he can do. The spirit of the living God inside of you. I speak it in Jesus' mighty name. I speak it. Any prayer warriors in the house, I invite you to come here. And I want us to pray. The Bible says we pray for one another so that we may be healed. All right? Life group leaders, any other le come on. It's time for us to have a spirit of prayer in his house today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God. It shall be. It shall be. Jesus said it is finished. It's finished. 
in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' mighty name, in the mighty name of Jesus of Nazareth, in the mighty name of Jesus, and there it is, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Restoration to families. Bow down before Him. For He is Lord of all. And sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. Yes, He has. Oh, come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As we continue to pray in this place, if there is anyone within the sound of my voice who would like to make Jesus their Lord and Savior, you have not been living for Him. This is not a question of whether you've been in church or how religious you are. I'm asking you, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And if you don't, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. You are not promised tomorrow. Now is the time. And I tell you with urgency this morning, make Him the Lord of your life. Will the battles and the trials and the storms go away? No. They won't. In fact, they may get worse. (laughs) But he is going to see you through, carry you through. You're going to experience a peace like you've never experienced before. You're going to find purpose like you've never, ever experienced before. And better than anything else, your name will be written. And the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says when one person, only one person comes to know him as Lord and Savior, all of the angels of heaven rejoice when one comes to know him. So I'm asking you this morning, if it's you, pray this prayer with me today. Everybody praying with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I thank you for going to the cross for me, for dying, taking on my sins, being crucified for all of my sins. You died You rose on the third day, and because of you, I have been risen to life. I make you my Lord and Savior, and I will never be the same. Never, 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 never will I be the same again, because I'm redeemed. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Woo, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us today, there is, listen, your name has been written right now. Death has been defeated and has no victory over you. You have just received eternal life in Jesus' name. Let me declare the word of the Lord for you before we're dismissed today. We've been doing this for two years, and God has supernaturally protected this congregation and its families. It's just awesome. I declare Psalm 91 over you today. Psalm 91, I I declare it, I've been declaring this over my daughters every single night, and I ask you, do the same over your family, do the same over your children, proclaim Psalm 91 over them every chance you get. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest under the shadow of the Almighty. They say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare. 
and from the deadly pestilence. And he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. And you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalk in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And you will tread on the lion and the cobra. And you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because they love me, says the Lord, I will rescue them. I will protect them for they acknowledge my name. They will call on me and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will deliver them and honor them. With long life I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. That is for you and your household. And now if you'll lift your hands for the blessing, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you his peace. May you always walk in the knowledge of who you are as a daughter of the King, as a son of the Most High God, that everywhere you go, you will know who your God is and who you are to Him. That blessing, abundance, purpose, and favor will follow you all the days of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for joining us online. I hope that you enjoyed service. I also want to invite you to join us here in person. You will notice the moment you walk in through these doors, there is something special in this church. What makes this church so unique, so special? It's the people. You will feel right at home here. We are family here at Compassion Church. In fact, you will walk in through these doors and somebody will find you and say, welcome home. I want to invite you to join us every Sunday here, 9 and 11, 2862 Thousand Oaks here in San Antonio, Texas. I hope to get to meet you soon. Thank you for joining us online. We'll see you next Sunday.